Good afternoon and welcome to Food 2030 Conference. You're very welcome to join us today on, of course, World Food Day. Now, there's a thousands of you watching all around. We didn't expect this to be all digital, but we're delighted that everyone can join from across the EU. And of course, we want this to be an interactive event and not just talking heads. So please do join in the discussion on social media. Use the hashtags Food2030EU on World Food Day or World Food Day Transforming. You can use all of those. We will also be using a special interactive tool called Slido. I'll tell you more about that a little bit later on. And of course, we are going to have a visual graphic artist who will be putting our thoughts and words and our discussions from our experts and our panel into visual form. So do watch out for that. Now, while we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about World Food Day. And to do that, we are going to be talking about transforming food systems through research and innovation. That's our theme for today. That's the discussion we really want to have. Joining me here in the studio to talk about that is John Bell from the European Commission, DG Research and Innovation, and you're the Director of Healthy Planet. John, tell me what that means, Director of Healthy Planet. What it means is I'm working with a team of people who are working with scientists, researchers, and innovators across Europe and the globe to try and map out new pathways to the solutions, the kind of world that we want to live in in the future with sustainable food systems, climate solutions, uh, new farming systems and new ways of organizing the economy where people live and work, about one in five of the people live and work in this area. So it's really about the new, the brave new world that we have to find ourselves in using research and innovation as our navigation tool. Okay, now today's event is organized, I should say, by the European Commission, the German Presidency of the European Council as well. So why did you want to organize it today? Well, World Food Day is becoming a very important moment in the year when we look at the main uh, part of our lives, the main system that we need to change to make the kind of world that we want to live in wherever we come from. Um, it's a particularly good moment this year. As we know, the World Food Programme has been awarded the Nobel Prize last week, which is recognizing the fact that the food, which is the common language of all people, is front and center in the big changes that we have to make together. Um, and so uh, why we want to do it now uh, for Europe, of course, it means it's a moment where Europe has set out a new pathway called the European Green Deal, which is an entirely new way of working in the European Union for the next 30 years. It's getting us to a greener, healthier, fairer kind of world. Um, it's also a moment to, uh, today to talk about how research and innovation can step up to the plate and bring the knowledge and the insight and the innovation that we have to make these changes happen and to bring people with us in, in doing that. Um, and of course, it's a moment where with Food 2030, an initiative that we launched at the Expo uh, back in 2015 in Italy, um, we're publishing a, a report on the next steps, the 10 pathways. In other words, we've done the what, what needs to be done, and now we need to talk about the how. So it's a great moment to talk and it's a great moment to listen to colleagues across the, the, the globe. Well, as you mentioned, it comes at the right time. And I did mention, of course, today is World Food Day. Um, and one of the other organizations involved in putting together this conference for you today is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Now, I would like to welcome Rodrigo de la Porta Montoya from the FAO. And um, Rodrigo, you're the director of the Liaison Office with the European Union and Belgium. So tell me why you're excited about today's event. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, to thank uh, Director Bell and all DG Research and Innovation uh, colleagues for inviting FAO uh, once again to celebrate this World Food Day uh, at the Food 2030 Conference. Uh, it has become a wonderful tradition because we celebrate this World Food Day with you and so many other uh, key partners for the last years. And it's also great to have the German, uh, the German Presidency of the Council associated. Um, why, why this World Food Day uh, is so special and why we are so excited about that. It's not only the most, or one of the most important United Nations International Days, celebrated each day uh, in more than 150 countries, but it's also uh, uh, when we are marking today the 75th anniversary of FAO. But as uh, Mr. Bell mentioned, this year event is even more special. The Nobel uh, Peace Prize awarded to our sister agency, the World Food Programme, makes all of us 
the whole UN, the whole international community, extremely proud and willing to celebrate even more in this moment where there is not so much uh, good news to go around. So I think that uh, this World Food Day, this World Food Week, food security is once again at the top of the political agenda. People uh, are reminded that there are millions of people who continue to suffer from chronic hunger. And I would like to quote here uh, the Norwegian Nobel Committee, who used, oh, by the way, a, a same quote from the World Food Program. And they say, until we have a vaccine, food is the best vaccine against chaos. Today, almost 700 million people still go hungry. Uh, the positive trends that we were experiencing, uh, experiencing over the last decade uh, have uh, been reversed. Uh, and by the end of the year, COVID-19 may add between 85 to 132 million more people hungry to, to the total number of, of undernourished. So this World Food Day is a moment of celebration, but a moment of reminding all of us that there is a, a moral imperative to feed the world safely, sustainably, with dignity uh, for all of us. Uh, as it was very urgent uh, right after the Second World War, uh, when the FAO was created 75 years ago. Absolutely, Rodrigo, that Nobel Peace Prize shows just how important it is and really spotlights the importance of a food sustainability. So tell me a bit about the themes. You said it's the 75th anniversary, so of course a celebratory theme, but tell me more about the specific uh, topics that you want to discuss today. Thanks, uh, Jennifer. So this year, World Food Day theme is uh, Grow, Nourish, Sustain. Together, our actions are our future. Uh, this vision of uh, a better world uh, calls for global solidarity for all of us, innovative solution, and this is where I believe uh, innovation and research is fundamental, and strong uh, partnership. We've always, my organization, recognized the importance of research and innovation in transforming food systems. Uh, so, uh, so, main, so my main message I would say today is that without research and without innovation, we will not achieve zero hunger and we will not achieve most of the SDGs. Uh, a few days ago, our Director General, uh, Mr. Chi Dong Yu, announced the appointment of the first ever Chief Scientist of FAO, who is gonna be a member of, the, of his lead, uh, leadership team, uh, Dr. Ismaham el uh, who is one of the most renewed scientists of the world. We are very proud to say that she's the, the third woman to join this core leadership team of FAO, bringing a total uh, gender parity. Uh, together with, with DU Research and Innovation, uh, we are convinced uh, that research and innovation is needed not only uh, in technologies, because it's the first thing people would be thinking of, but in policy, in governance, in partnerships. And we are supporting innovative work in a number of areas of the agri-food systems, food security and nutrition, preservation of biodiversity, innovative genetic resources, social innovation. So uh, our partnership enables us to, to mobilize knowledge, uh, gain from science, academia, research, uh, but it helps us, it help us also this great partnership with you to promote education and learning, which is fundamental for the new generations, strengthen the capacities of governments, provide evidence-based solutions to policy processes in developing countries to replicate success stories. So I wanted also to underline our joint work in the international fora, uh, such as the United Nations Forum for Sustainable Standards and the many things we, we do there. Uh, and our collaboration includes a greater and better use of uh, digital tools and artificial intelligence, satellite imaging, remote sensing, mobile and blockchain application, so uh, again, uh, we are at a moment of a crossroads. We have 10 years to achieve the SDGs. Without a research and innovation, we will not achieve SDGs. We need to act more urgently, effectively than ever before. Together, we can, we can meet our future needs without depleting our natural resources and improve lives for generations to come with research and innovation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. And I believe we have a video highlighting some of the themes you just mentioned. Yes, thank you very much. Yes.
وكان يعمل راعيا للماشية لقد علمني أن الغذاء هو سبيل السعادة porque los caminos que recorremos se entrelazan, dando vida a una infinita variedad de historias. Los poissons que yo pesco cada día, no los encuentro que en sus ojos. Nos proporcionamos la vida, sostenemos la vida. Y nosotros debemos nutrir el mundo. Es hora de tomar acción. Todos tenemos un rol para jugar. Давайте добьемся лучшего в жизни и в обществе повсюду. We need a food system that sustains lives, the planet, and protects its workers. لأن مصيرنا واحد، أفعالنا هي مستقبلنا. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for your welcome and intervention. I think that uh, video says it all. Now, before we move on to our last sponsor of today's event, which is, of course, the German presidency, I did promise you that today will be interactive. So let's have a look at the Slido app, which is what we're going to use to get your thoughts and questions. You don't have to download anything. You can go on your browser to slido.com or sli.do. Now, when you get there, you will be asked to put in the code for the event, and that is FOOD2030EU. That's the same hashtag we're going to use all day, so keep it to hand, use it, tweet it, send it to your friends, and put that code in and answer the question, which is, which organization do you come from? This is just to get you started, uh, test that it's working, let you uh, get on with answering that question. I know there are several thousand people who are tuned in online to watch us today, so it'd be nice to know a little bit about you as well as about us. But finally, we will go now to the German Federal Minister of Education and Research, Anja Karliczek. Hello to all of you taking part in this World Food Day online event. The coronavirus pandemic has made the situation for the poorest people in the world even more acute. Many have lost their jobs and no longer have any income. Children are at risk of becoming the biggest victims of the pandemic because many of their parents no longer have the money to provide food. In some parts of the world, hunger is a problem affecting all generations. And food security is therefore an issue that goes far beyond the coronavirus pandemic. More and more people live on this planet. So we use more and more resources for food. This poses great challenges for our environment and the climate. If we in Europe cooperate closely, we can make agricultural production more sustainable. In this way, we can ensure food security even in times of more climate change. That is why we are working together with the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture on the Joint Programming Initiative on Agricultural Food Security and Climate Change. We are committed to implementing the bioeconomy. Bioeconomy research helps us to increase crop hardiness and yields, to make better use of farmland, to use bioresources to their fullest extent, or to reuse them multiple times, and to pay attention to the global impacts of our economy on local markets. There is still a great need for much more research and innovation. So let us use this day to discuss the most promising ideas and fertile approaches for our system of food production and nutrition. I am convinced that together we can drive this transformation towards a more sustainable and resilient economy and food supply for the good of all. I wish you every success in this endeavor. We have some results from our first Slido question there, although I see only 195 of you have answered, but of those, almost half are from research and university backgrounds. We also have many people, about a quarter from the public sector and government, private sectors, NGOs, citizens, and, and a very small amount of media. But I know that there's a lot of you out there who aren't using it because we can see the numbers, and I know that there is a lot more than 200 people watching. So I'm going to move on to our next question 
which is a little bit more substantial. We want you to follow along and we want to know what more we can do in terms of research and innovation to deliver on food system transformation. You've got several options there. Now, this is where you can really feed into the discussion where we're going to be having later today because we're going to reflect on what you people watching at home, what the audience thinks, what everyone really feels. And we can see your options are focus on RI funding on key pathways for change, mobilize and increase private sector RI, collaborate across silos, improve our insights on food systems, invest in social sciences, or build capacity to experiment, pilot, and demonstrate. Those are your options. We are going to be talking about those points later on, so it'll be helpful to know which ones are gaining the most traction. Now, We've had our welcome from our three supporters of today's event. We're now going to move on to talking specifically about food system transformation in action. And so I'm very pleased that I still have John here with me in the studio, as John, you know an awful lot more about this than I do. So what is your view on the ongoing food system transformation and the role of EU R&I policies therein? I mean, you've seen the question we're asking, what would your answer be to this? I think, as Minister Karlochek has just said, what we need coming out of uh, this terrible period that we're going through is a food system that's really fit for the future. And that means, depending on where you live or work, it means that the conditions in which food is produced in terms of climate or biodiversity or working beyond chemical pesticides or finding new solutions to how we grow and nourish our food or alternative plant systems or food in cities or whatever way food is going to uh, play a part in our lives, that we need to accelerate that transition using ideas and using innovation and using people and using a better form of governance. So the food system transformation, in a way, is a shorthand for the journey that the whole of a society has to make on climate and biodiversity and on work and all the rest coming out of this terrible period. So critically, it has to be a pathway for recovery, as one in five people in the European Union work in, in one way or another in the food system. For our neighborhood, where we have a responsibility for Africa, for other parts of, of, of the world, we have to share the knowledge and involve people in building the common knowledge on how to do this together. And part of this, of course, is working towards this uh, UN Food Systems Summit next year, where the work we're doing today in setting out what these 10 pathways we think could be, the how, and at starting this conversation today, is then to commission the work that needs to be done through Horizon Europe, this new 90 billion euro program, where we will have new partnerships with member states and international partners. We'll have these five great missions, these moonshot initiatives, three of which directly relate to the future of food, the one on the soil restoration and food systems, one on the oceans and the water systems, and the one on climate adaptation. And we'll also have, um, we just launched a European Green Deal call in which there's a 74 million uh, uh, opening for people to come forward with their ideas by January the 26th and do something practical. So, it's really a critical opportunity to say to the community and the younger generation of people who are out there, you know, now is the moment. Like, this is a terrible moment that we're all living in. Let's build the kind of recovery that we want and let's put a sustainable food system at the center of that. Well, I've heard it said quite a lot that crisis can often be the mother of invention. We see that in various different sectors. Now, you did mention the, the new publication, The Pathways for Action. Can you say a little bit more about that? Tell us a little bit more detail. What we're trying to do, we, so in Food 2030, we said we needed to look at how the food system needs to react and, and deal with using research innovation for big things, climate, circular systems, uh, innovation, and nutrition. And nutrition, remember, is at the center of, of all of this. And after the last four or five years of working together and doing a lot of work with the scientific community, innovation community, we've set out 10 pathways. In other words, how are we going to get the, the destination of what a sustainable food system means to different people? So the idea is between now and the UN summit, uh, we'll be working on developing these pathways with all of you out there. And they're looking at issues like what Re Rodrigo pointed out, the governance of the food system, how the, that, that should change. What do we mean by food in cities? Half of the world's cities will be built in the next 20 years in the, in the developing world. How do we deal with the issue of food from the oceans and freshwater resources at a critical point? Two billion people around the world are dependent on fisheries and the fish are moving. Um, and that's when they're not tied up in plastic. The alternative proteins and dietary shift um, the alternative food and feed, the shift away from using, in Europe, more than half of the land is used to feed animals. Um, how do we get the most proteins and alternatives to the people who need it most? Uh, food waste and resource efficiency. About, it's, 
Um, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of emissions uh, in the world. So how do we change that? The microbiome, this is this extraordinary breakthrough. Um, it'll be the biggest change in solutions since the Genome Project in the 80s, is, is basically the gut microbiomes. How can we develop new alternatives to medicines and foods in that? Personalized nutrition, how each person can have the kind of food produced for them um, or for people like them. And then very important issues like how are we going to use data in terms of making sure that we have the right kind of food systems in the right places. And in the European Union, Africa is close to our hearts. So how are we going to deepen our cooperation with Africa in working from the ground up in making all of this knowledge available to the, particularly the new generation of researchers and innovators who we see emerging all over the African continent? Well, you mentioned researchers and innovators. We do have, very excitingly today, we have some of these researchers and innovators who are going to tell us about their projects. So we're going to see a really hands-on transformation R&I. Now, let me first introduce our first, that is Daria Volt from the Fraunhofer Institute, and it's the BiProFood project. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Daria Wold and I work at the Fraunhofer Institute for Process Engineering and Packaging in Freising, which is close to Munich. I work there since 2017 as a research associate and PhD student in the Department of Food Process Development, where we aim to develop tailor-made functional food ingredients. Speaking about transforming the food system, I want to introduce to you the project BiproFood and one of our results, the banana peer puree. The project BiproFood is about the holistic use of coffee, mango and banana fruits to increase the sustainability of the fruit processing industry by using unexploded side streams. And why is this important? If you think about the banana, the peel makes up to 40% of the whole fruit. And up to now, those peels are mainly discarded in landfills or used as feed. So we tried to figure out solutions to use those side streams because they actually contain high amounts of valuable compounds like phenolic compounds or fibers to produce food products. Now, if you think about the banana peel, there are some challenges that might come up. For example, the astringency or the fast discoloration. I'm pretty sure that some of you might also think about the contamination with pesticide residues. And to get that ahead, we did several testings of organically grown banana peels and we could show that they don't pose any health risk to the consumer. We were pretty glad about that and also that we were able to produce a puree which we could incorporate in different food products like cakes or smoothies where it added a really nice fruity flavor and we were so surprised because this product on its own is also really delicious for example as a topping for ice cream. So we are really surprised that we were able to use a waste stream to produce a food product. Our results just demonstrated the feasibility of producing sensory appealing food ingredients from raw materials that are perceived as a waste so far. And this was possible even though coffee, mango and banana peels are quite different. So. If you take this thought one step further, it just opens up a whole new range of sources for the production of food ingredients. Of course, you could think about other food processing residues, but you could also have a look at the local food industry. What about sugar beet leaves or potato peels, which might be an interesting source for the production of food protein? So I personally see the potential of those unused side streams to produce healthy and functional food ingredients. And I really hope that we can convince the consumers that we don't want to trick them into eating low value side streams, but that we are actually expanding the range of food products for them. Well, that was fascinating. You mentioned food waste. I would never have thought of eating banana skins, um, but presumably this is the sort of innovation that you want to see more of. Yeah, we're moving towards a post-waste society, and what we're seeing, strangely enough, is farmers and producers are making more out of the innovative side streams than from the main products themselves because of the way some of the markets have been set up. So this is a brilliant example of what the future food will look like. Brilliant. Okay, well, we have our second innovator, and that is Lucretia Bellido from the World Food Programme, supported by, and that is H2 Grow Project.
We grow food in impossible places. My name is Lucrecia Bellido and I work for the United Nations World Food Program. I'm part of the age to grow project team. I'm currently based in Chad, where I have been implementing age to grow for the past three years. Here, the local population and the refugees rely on external food aid and the livestock, which is poorly fed. Together with them, we are piloting a project to grow fodder for the animals using the hydroponic technique and with locally available materials. Edge to Grow is one of WFP's innovation projects, a portfolio of hydroponic solutions. Hydroponics is a soilless and resource efficient agric agriculture technique that saves up to 90% of water in comparison to traditional agriculture. The aim of the project is to enable access to fresh food to grow vegetables and animal fodder in areas where this would otherwise not be possible. The innovation story of h 2 grow is a story of adapting an existing technique, making it available and fit for context. Instead of using a high-tech approach, h 2 grow has simplified hydroponics to make it accessible, available and impactful for vulnerable communities. Over the past years, we have focused on creating low-tech hydroponic units in harsh environments using locally available materials together with the communities and we are now implementing the project in nine different countries around the world. We want to positively impact the lives of thousands of families. We aim for self-reliant communities able to grow their own food, feed their families, feed their animals and get an extra income by the selling of the surplus of their hydroponic production. How do we want to do this? We are doing this through the digital edge to grow platform, which is our vehicle for global scale. It targets not only to bring together the global and local hydroponics community, but more importantly, it enables training and knowledge sharing for practitioners as well as for hydroponic farmers. One example of how we foster the global community are virtual age to grow research workshops in which we are bringing together experts on the field of hydroponics, aiming at facilitating collaboration, making global research and knowledge accessible in the field. Our hopes for the future are to be a catalyst for hydroponics through WFP, our partners, the governments and the private sector. If you want to learn more or are an expert on this field, join the hydroponics revolution. Contact me or the global team here. Well, you mentioned hydroponics in your, in your comments mm -hmm. earlier. Um, we can't talk about food without talking about water as well. Mm -hmm. No, it's extraordinary. Again, you see this combination of uh, brilliant innovation in hydroponics, how water, which is, the, which is life and is the most precious resource that we're going to be dealing with, including in Europe and everywhere else, digital technology, which is allowing the world to become a library to anybody, and localized needs and knowledge to be brought together. So everybody can become a farmer, whether you're in Chad, as Letitia is talking about there, or you're in one of the new cities uh, anywhere uh, in, in the world. And I think this is why the food systems opportunities, we need to see what it is that can make the best solutions possible locally to each kind of person. But this is a, another great example of bringing things together and making them available locally. Yeah, I was impressed that she said that we're using low tech solutions, yeah. that you don't have a huge financial outlay in, in areas where they just, that isn't that available. So we're going on to our last innovator today. That is a, a team of Philippe Merck and Adrian Capsalis, who are the founders of Lowy. If you have bad eyesight, you do an eye test. Why? Because if you would get any standardized lenses, you would probably see even worse than before. And only if you get lenses that perfectly match your individual needs, you can see clearly. If you're looking at nutrition and health, we are still using standardized lenses. And that's exactly the problem we are solving with Louvi. We are a scientific spin-off of Technical University of Munich and we are making personalized health and nutrition accessible to everyone. The heart of that concept is our proprietary personalization engine, which considers more than 9,000 interactions with diseases, medications, as well as allergies. That's why we are currently working with elite athletes who are winning to the front stages, women who are going through menopause, as well as diabetes or even cancer patients at the same time. That's the power of data-driven personalization.
best way to have a lasting impact on the food system is by fostering innovation. But innovation does not only take great ideas and vision, but also access to capital and a solid industry network. And in the world there is no lack of imagination, but a lot of great ideas are basically disappearing because of a lack of access to funding, bureaucracy and legal hurdles, especially in the space of health and food. So let's see how we can bring together regulatory bodies, industry players and investors to change the food system and make the world a healthier place. We are a great example that the European Union is already on a great track. In our first steps, we were supported by the European Social Funds when we did our first R&D. And when we started to go to market, we were part of the EIT fan program, an accelerator, which gave us great connections to investors and industry experts. And now, as we are a bigger and more um, mature Sure company, we are an EIT rising food stars. This is a network that gives us access to industry players and leading research institutions. So yes, we are on a good track, but there's still a lot of work to do. So for example, we're still facing bureaucracy hurdles. Even if we just want to expand our business from Germany to our neighboring country, Austria, and the food and health regulations differ from every member state of the European Union to the other. Technology is evolving ever faster and we have the feeling that regulations cannot keep up with the speed of new developments. If there's one thing you keep in mind from today, it's that changing the food system is not something for the future, but it's happening now. Well, that was a pretty fascinating video. I think you probably chime with a lot of what you heard. Yeah, it's brilliant uh, what Philippe and Adrian were, were presenting, and indeed some of their conclusions are right smack bang in, I mean, the future is happening, people can't see it yet, and of course, the, because of the way in which food moves onto the market, into homes and all the rest, we all have to be extremely careful in terms of making sure that what, we, what we're dealing with is, is fit and healthy and, and, and so forth, but they're changing the paradigm. I mean, the paradigm so far has been about the treatment through medicines of all kinds of conditions and the kind of food solutions that are going to be there for people that are down to people with certain conditions or certain profiles or certain needs or certain age groups um, is going to completely transform both the quality of people's lives and indeed the impact on the health system down the, li down the line and of course the possibility to grow new businesses. Um, I've seen a number of uh, examples like this coming from the EIT, again another acronym, we love our acronyms in Brussels, the European Institute of Technology, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a community of practice of innovators who are at the market end of things and bringing great ideas to market and bringing them to investors and scaling them up and so forth. And they're at a very early stage in launching a lot of these great companies, so it's great to see them moving forward. But some of the things they were talking about there are going to fundamentally change the way in which we can actually fulfill our potential as people and avoid some of the conditions and the heavy treatments and difficulties that we have. I give an example. It was a great project I saw uh, last year of somebody who had actually worked on a form of, um, we call it the microbiome I mentioned earlier on, a microbiotic um, kind of food that was able to nourish people who cannot chew because of different conditions. There are 15 million people in the European Union who cannot chew their food for all kinds of different reasons, something that none of us would even think about. So finding solutions that can make it possible for people to nourish themselves and keep well and doing things is a fantastic opportunity. So when we think in this grim time that we're all living in at the moment, when we stand on our balconies, we look outside and we look at each other, we've got to think about this generation of people coming through who are going to make things really, really uh, a much better and healthier place for all of us. Well, you notice that each of our three innovators, we ask them two questions to explain their innovation, and then secondly, what were their hopes for the future? So I'm going to ask you that question. What are your hopes for the future? Well, my hope for the future is that uh, we've seen two great examples there, that food, which is, um, it's, it's really, as I said, it's our common language. It's, it's the table, if you like, is, is, is the universal gathering place of, of our society, civilization that what we see emerging very quickly is a way of people to live their lives 
that is part of, number one, a climate-friendly environment, that there are new businesses that start up and new jobs that start up that are closer to where people live and work, that the distribution of the ideas and the value is shared by everybody in the chain from the farmer and the rural community to the people with their own startup businesses in local communities, that cities and neighbourhoods and, and, uh, and families and, and countryside become places where food is able to be generated regardless of the changes that are going to come with climate and water and everything else because we've shared knowledge, that knowledge becomes the connective tissue in a society that's looking out for each other. In other words, that we build back better, that the recovery and the use of research and innovation can be there to make things better that we didn't think actually could be fixed. We thought the food system, it's so big and so complex and so difficult, couldn't be fixed. So it, to really improve the, the lives, the, 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 the economy, the, the society, and the impact on, on our environment would be a fun, and I think it, it is going to happen. Thank you, John. You will be back to talk to us a little bit later on after we've heard. I also want to say thank you very much to our innovators and their hands-on uh, descriptions of their innovations by Pro Food, H2 Grow and Lowy. Um, fascinating insights there into what's actually happening on the ground. Now, I would say that I want you all to tweet about them. I want you to use the hashtag food2030eu and hashtag World Food Day. And also, don't forget, we've left that slider question open. We want to get your thoughts on what more we can do in terms of research and innovation to deliver on the food system transformation. We're going to come on now to our keynote speaker. I am very pleased to be able to introduce Professor Joachim von Braun, who is the Professor for Economic and Technological Change at the University of Bonn and also Chair of the Scientific Group for the UN Food Systems Summit. Professor von Braun, you're going to tell us a bit about how can R&I accelerate the ongoing food systems transformation towards sustainability, one of the key words we've been hearing there today. So I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I uh, um, applaud the European Commission um, for picking the topic of uh, uh, science and research and innovation as a key theme for this World Food Day. I'm pleased to be with uh, you, John Bell, and Rodrigo, Rodrigo de la, uh, la Puerta, and Anja Karliczek, and the innovators which we just heard. Why is it so important that we focus on uh, research and innovation um, in the context of food and nutrition security? Looking at the uh, contribution of innovation to agricultural productivity, I suggest that uh, nowadays uh, world agriculture is um, to 80 percent growing um, by innovation and no longer by more inputs such as uh, land, water, and, and other inputs. So that is um, a, a critical um, lens through which we need to look at, um, at uh, food and nutrition security. I will address um, uh, briefly uh, five points. Um, um, first, uh, food systems must serve people and planet. Secondly, mobilizing research and innovation for reducing hunger the systems transformation and the sustainability aspect, which you emphasize in today's workshop. Third, the redesigning of um, the research governance for food and agriculture. Um, I emphasize that because um, as we all know, um, R and I is so important. So are we governing, governing it appropriately? I will briefly touch on the farm to fork strategy and um, and on the World Food System Summit, which we are headed for next year. We probably all agree that food systems must serve people and planet, um, planet being nature, the environment, the climate issues, and um, it currently does not. The food system we have is not serving people and planet. I list here the nine big failures which we currently have in the food system. The scale of hungry and undernourished people, uh, Rodrigo mentioned that already, the stunting among children, the micronutrient deficiencies, the lack of healthy diets, um, uh, not affordable by 3 billion people. We're actually not producing enough 
healthy diet, food. The obesity pandemic, the unsafe food, the high food loss and waste, the environmental destruction to land, water, seas, and the atmosphere, and the poverty on the farms. So it's a multi-pronged problem which we need to address when we want to see the food system transformed. It has uh, uh, not only production and uh, consumption aspects, but also resource utilization aspects. It is important that we understand uh, what we are talking about when we talk food system. The food system interacts with other systems, the health system, the energy system, the ecology and climate system. The four major building blocks of the food system are agriculture, nutrition and health, markets, and the services related to it, digitization was already mentioned, and the income and employment side um, inside the food system. And I depicted here the interlinkages and these uh, blue flashpoints are the key points of entry where innovation and research makes the biggest differences. So there is um, scope for innovation all over the place within the food system, but there are a few particularly promising areas which are highlighted here. Uh, and um, that's of strategic importance. The food system we want serving people and pl planet involves all actors in production, aggregation, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal of food products must be involved, has to be participatory. The food system we want delivers food security and nutrition for all so that economic, social, and environmental sustainability are not compromised. The three pillars of uh, sustainability, it serves the SDG. Now we talk a lot about transformation. That needs, and that actually means radical change and transformation needs a lot of research and innovation. But we also need to think about the end game. What are we planning, hoping for, strategizing the transformation will end up to produce? So transformation of food system to what? My point here is to a key component of the circular sustainable bioeconomy, which embraces um, sustainable use of biological resources, the complete use of biological knowledge and the innovation in biological processes. So um, when talking about transformation, I encourage um, our debates in the future to be more uh, focused on where do we want to end up. Um, SDG number two, end hunger, is an important milestone on the pathway of the transformation of the food system, but we need to think beyond. Mobilizing research and innovation for reducing hunger, the system's transformation and sustainability requires action. This is the word of uh, uh, hungry people. Ending hunger by 2030 is still feasible. The benefits are huge. We have new research on the table on the question, what would it cost? Meeting the G7 commitments, and the EU is part of that, of lifting 500 million people out of hunger by 2030 requires additional investments of about 14 billion US dollars per year until 2030. So every year, added 14. Ending hunger, however, requires an additional 25 to 36 billion investments in addition to the 14 I just mentioned. And science and innovation and innovative policies are key aspects of that. How do we come to these numbers? Um, one key study on this um, uh, released this week uh, by uh, my institute and the Food and Agriculture Organization and a large group of researchers um, has assembled um, uh, hundreds of studies and uh, figured out what is the return to hunger reduction 
of um, uh, 24 interventions ranked by their impact. And um, uh, the technical term here is, uh, this is a marginal abatement curve of hunger reduction. The specialists among you know this uh, from climate or water use in the world. The small print here uh, shows you that innovation and research um, is all over the map of this um, marginal abatement curve. It's fundamental in not only in agricultural R&D ranking um, uh, highly effective at low costs, but also in crop protection, in reducing waste and losses, in nutrition programs and in social protection programs, the innovative style. This needs to happen in partnership, the ending hunger. Looking to a successful low and middle income countries that reduced hunger by more than 50% in the last couple of decades uh, shows that they stand out with higher economic growth, higher agricultural growth, uh, strong investment uh, by governments in capital and strong investments in education and health. Hunger reduction goes hand in hand with improvements in policy on sectoral, structural and macroeconomic development. I list a few examples here of countries, there are a lot more. Why would we need a redesign of food and agriculture research governance? Well, I've just highlighted research innovation and uh, translation into action of innovation is so important to move to a world without hunger and a sustainable food system that doesn't ruin the environment. We must mobilize the science community, overcome coordination failure within the science community and between the science community and policy making and assist in prioritizing innovation investments and policy options. This is the framework we should aim for. It's the framework broadly borrowed from the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which has um, worked um, quite effectively to move climate agenda forward. A evidence producing science domain, mobilizing tens of thousands of scientists in food, nutrition, agriculture, and related social science, and the policy domain, governmental and non-governmental organization interacting with them, and um, uh, on a platform where coordination is happening. Let me come briefly on the EU agenda, the farm to fork strategy and more. Uh, which is a refreshing new uh, look at uh, the challenges. Um, chapter three, um, for a moment being technical, uh, is called enabling the transition with research, innovation, technology, and investments. I applaud that. It's part of the Green Deal and um, headed towards a sustainable bioeconomy. My question mark is, are the external effects properly on the radar? This is where science and policy can debate in the future. I also applaud chapter four, promoting the global transition. Transition again here. The EU, I quote, will focus its international cooperation on food research and innovation. And then there comes a long list of action areas. And that's a great list. It's a very promising strategy where we, I think, need discussion is um, um, an implementation plan for it that embraces um, the development opportunity. So external effects and implementation plan are probably the work where um, administration, policy making and the science community can interact. Let me conclude with a few remarks on the huge opportunity of the World Food System Summit of the UN Secretary General to be um, um, held uh, later next year. Opportunities for Europe and all to engage in this um, uh, summit are tremendous. And I'm very pleased um, to have heard already the remarks from uh, John Bell uh, on the European initiatives. The main pillars um, of activities are dialogues at country and regional level, action tracks of uh, major investment areas, champions supporting uh, policy implementation, Actually, the idea of a people's summit having big involvement 
by civil society organizations of all kinds. A digital platform is currently in the making, all at a fairly early stage. Um, I've put here in green the scientific group because it relates to uh, the emphasis of our workshop today. I happen to chair this group. Uh, it is tasked as um, being responsible for ensuring that the summit brings to bear the foremost scientific evidence from around the world. So it's a very international group formed early in its work. Um, and um, uh, it um, will have to also engage in the follow-up to the summit uh, by all in partnership. Let me thank you um, with the remark, research and innovation is essential to accelerate the ongoing food system transformation towards sustainability. And sustainability means here ending hunger and serving people and planet. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor. Um, you mentioned the farm to fork strategy uh, rather favorably. Is that enough? Is the EU doing enough at policy level or is there more that you think could be done? Well, I cautiously, Mark um, here, um, we want to see the action and the implementation plan. Um, and um, a, um, uh, an emphasis on what will be the uh, effects on other countries, other regions, and their people. That's what I mean by external effects. Uh, the opportunities for that uh, will be in EU, African Union, and, uh, and other consultations, say, with Asia. Uh, that's where the mobilization uh, needs to be. And I want to refer back to the investment um, needed uh, for the end hunger strategy with the sustainability components that I mentioned. The EU has to have a major commitment uh, to mobilize the, um, uh, its fair share in the 14 billion needed to uh, achieve the sustainable development goal, uh, zero hunger by 2030. So that uh, share is hefty, that's, uh, we are talking about a few billions, um, small numbers compared to what um, is currently happening in the European Union uh, to cope with uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, but um, it needs to be mobilized for the long term. We need a 10-year fund for this, um, and I hope that will uh, come about soon. We're getting some questions in from our audience on Slido for you, Professor. Massimo Burioni uh, says that RNI is constantly improving food systems and being more sustainable, but they don't have a great influence on policy making. And how might that be improved? Well, um, uh, the, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, uh, the, um, uh, investment opportunities are not yet uh, sufficiently well understood. Um, and um, the um, uh, SDG 2 mobilization, however, has tremendously gained in, um, in the recent uh, uh, months, uh, not only because uh, of the Peace Nobel Prize uh, for WFP, but um, so many countries have successfully uh, launched uh, 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 nutritional improvement and, and food security programs um, uh, in Africa uh, and in South Asia. So I, I see it uh, rather positively. And SDGs, of course, the Sustainable Development Goals. And a related question has come in, that is how can social scientific knowledge influence, not policy now, but industry standards and production? Um, an extremely important question. We need uh, proper standards that are fair to producers in low-income countries. Um, we have this ongoing strong debate in the um, textile industry. Um, we need that in food, we need that in cocoa, coffee, uh, tea, etc. Uh, we need um, fair social and environmental standards that don't uh, um, undermine the opportunities uh, of uh, uh, emerging economies, but uh, uh, consumers want that. European consumers increasingly want uh, to, uh, uh, to consume uh, food items and, uh, and wear clothes and, and uh, use other consumer products that uh, don't have child labor and exploitation embedded in them.
And, and uh, we, have we have another, another question, question here. It's, it's a, a little, little bit off the topic, but it says personalized nutrition sounds like a great idea, but what happens to the social aspects of family meals when everyone nibbles from their personalized venues? Do you have thoughts on that? It's a, it's a thought for the future. Personalized nutrition uh, will become more and more relevant uh, in the future. Uh, and um, uh, because of uh, the health attributes, um, why shouldn't we be around the family dinner table and uh, each eating our separate meal uh, coming out of the, um, uh, uh, the little equipment standing next to the refrigerator where we grow uh, in the kitchen our, uh, our own vegetables uh, in hydroponics. Um, and um, uh, we will find, find ways to stick together. Thank you very much, Professor. And I, I will wrap up by asking you, have you any final message for all our people watching today, um, looking at World Food Day and, and, and the recent Nobel Peace Prize and the importance of food? Presumably, although we're in the midst of a crisis, we're uh, trying to take some positives away. Don't leave it up to policymakers alone. This is uh, everyone's task in uh, Europe and beyond. Um, the the idea of um, uh, ending hunger requires a change in worldview. We have large communities who are uh, supportive of that. Uh, together we can do that. Um, and uh, so um, uh, engage. Thank you very much, Professor. Engagement is indeed what we are all about here today. Food 2030 Conference. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Professor, for your thoughts and your presentation. Now, I am keeping an eye. I'm keeping an eye on social media. I see on Twitter that Oscar Castellani has said thanks to the European Commission for the inspiring talks from the innovators. Martha Redway said it was amazing to hear about the innovations, like turning banana peels into foods, as well, of course, hydroponics and data-driven personalized nutrition. Do keep sending in your thoughts using those hashtags World Food Day and Food 2030 EU. And we still have Slido open. You can send in your questions and you can also vote in that poll. We do want to see more of you taking part in the poll because we want to know what the thoughts are. Now we're going to move on to our panel debate where we have some excellent speakers for you and I'm going to introduce Natalie Chazé who is the European Commission from the DG Health and Food Safety, and she is the Director of Food Sustainability International Relations. We also have Martin Frick from the United Nations, Deputy to the Special Envoy for the UN Food Systems Summit 2021. Diane Holdorf is the Managing Director, Food and Nature at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Emma Chow is the Lead Food Initiative at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And last but not least, Irene Tolleray, Member of the European Parliament, is also co-founder of the European Food Forum and sits as co-chair, in fact, of the Wine, Spirits and Quality Foodstuffs Intergroup in the European Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, can you all hear me? Are we all there? I'm here, hello. <laughs> Splendid, that's great. I'm going to start off with a general question, just an opening question to get us all started. So what can we do more to mobilize researchers, innovators and entrepreneurs? You heard some inspiring stories. What more needs to happen to make their work easier and more fruitful? Uh, let me first give that one. Uh, Diane, I'm going to start with you, please. Much. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for allowing me to participate in such an exciting event today. There was an amazing amount of innovation shared, and I was quite excited by this. We have a really amazing opportunity this year and into next year with all of the change going on at the political level, as well as with the UN Food Systems Summit, as was referenced, to really gain a momentum and accelerate the transformations that we need for the Food Systems Summit. There's quite a bit that we can do relative to ensuring that business has a leadership role to play. And I'm really pleased to be able to represent the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We have more than 200 leading companies who are working on these issues and more than 70 of them are in the food programs at WBCSD, where we're working across many partnerships to really drive 
where are the places where business can lead and what are the opportunities that we see where we need the types of support of an enabling environment? And perhaps I'll just share a few points on that, if I may now, and then we can come back to it in conversation. We recently held a science to policy dialogue, a first of its kind deep dive three day event where we looked at what is the science that's driving much of the decision making in this first instance around diets and healthy food choices and the role of we all have in helping to engage and bring people and consumers along with us in this journey to create a healthy and sustainable food system. We took into consideration the challenges of COVID-19 and the bright light that that has shown on the inequities and weaknesses in our system to really think through where is the innovation and where are some of these opportunities to strengthen performance both in the private sector as well as in government. And I thought I would just lift perhaps a few of the policy thoughts that came from that conversation. One is that there's a real opportunity to accelerate and better leverage public-private partnerships and cross-sectoral multi-stakeholder partnerships to really accelerate innovation. We can look to how policy supports new business models, how we scale the right types of incentives through regulations, and how we engage with finance and finance sector and the finance mechanisms available at the government level to really create some of the shifts that we know that we want to see across the total food system. There's other aspects as well that we see at the global, national, and even local levels. There's such opportunity to enhance the capacity to innovate, particularly particularly at a local level. And this is where some of these really key partnership opportunities come to play. Technologies such as digital innovations, even ways to enhance awareness and communication, building that consumer opportunity for engagement, and then also using technology where possible to harmonize, drive transparency, simplify guidelines, improve labeling. There's all kinds of things that we can do to improve choice, build trust, and really drive towards the transformations that we wanna see. I'll pause there and hand it back, but really looking forward to the continued conversation on these key points. Plan. I'm going to turn to uh, Martin Frick. The similar sort of question to you, how is the UN Food Systems Summit going to address research and innovation? How is it going to promote it? Well, thank you very much. And we heard already <clears throat> some excellent remarks about that. And I start basically with Professor from Brown, who has said, don't leave it up to the policymakers. So we will be addressing policymakers, but this is really very, very much about a bottom-up approach. And concretely for young entrepreneurs, this is often a possibility and a difficulty to really get your voices heard with your governments. And we are rolling out, that will be later today actually, um, food system summit dialogues in every single member state of the United Nations. And we particularly encourage participation of civil society, of small and medium-sized enterprises, also to give these innovators and entrepreneurs a space where their voice can be heard and where they can propagate their ideas and basically show that food systems um, transformation really um, is possible. And when we are speaking about a shift, the transformation of our food systems, we have quite often this David versus Goliath sort of situation. And so broadly speaking, um, as this is supposed to be a people summit and we are put, putting a lot of energy in here to really empower people, this should help many little Davids really also to stand up against Goliaths and show that the transformation of our food systems is possible. And back to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Martin. I'm going to turn actually now to Emma Chow. Emma, Similar question to you, what from your perspective can be done? What more needs to be done? Yeah, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's been really such a pleasure to listen to all the remarks so far and, and see some of the on the ground innovations earlier because I would love to highlight the, the realm of innovations. And we use that word and throw it around a lot. And it can be high and low tech, frugal tech. We've seen some really incredible solutions and, and Sometimes it's not always about scaling, but actually replicating with food. So how can you have more distributed 
um, systems and innovate the ways of working. And that's been really interesting for us on the foundation working on food over the past couple of years and working with city governments, but also consortia of stakeholders, other NGOs, including businesses, big and small, and actually how do you start to innovate on new ways of working, both within singular organizations and across the silos and departments that are created because food crosses so many, if not all of them. And at the same time, looking at city government, how do you, again, work across the silos? And something that's really important that we've been peeling back the layers on is the interactions between different levels of government. So if a city wants to be shifting their procurement of food, for instance, it, it's going to be ben very beneficial to be working in close partnership with the regional or national government who typically oversees the agricultural production. Otherwise, you're less able to be leveraging that urban demand, for instance. So I think just opening our minds to what innovation actually means is absolutely critical. Thank you very much, Emma. Now, I deliberately left our representatives of the two EU institutions until last. Um, so let me ask then, Natalie. Um, we heard uh, the professor say, don't leave it to politicians. Does that mean don't leave it to policymakers as well? Or, or what more can we be doing? Je suis Nathalie Charles et j'essaie de joindre le... Allô Nathalie. Attendez, je vais voir. Can you hear me Yes, we can, Nathalie. Great. Thank you for joining okay. us. Um, the first thing, how is it important to mo mobilize researchers and innovators? I would say it's more than important for us. It is essential that we actively support the transition to a sustainable food system. Um, with our Farm to Fork strategy, the Commission has presented, let's say, an ambitious agenda. We see that most people share the objective, they share that there, is, there are problems and they share the need to change, but they do not all necessarily know how to move. At the same time, the transition can only be a success if all actors at all levels of the food chain make efforts. So we need science and technology to help us bring in solutions at all levels. I would also add that today, I think it's important, we are promoting the importance to shift to sustainable food system globally, and we are mobilizing also partners country, third country. So the EU should lead this transformation also from a research and innovation policy angle. It is therefore crucial to engage researchers in the EU, but also internationally to become an enabler for change. And here, I would like to clarify, but we are not only talking about technological innovation, but also social and economic innovation in the food chain. And I believe that the multi-actor approach of Horizon 2020, which is also foreseen in Horizon Europe, will be helpful because it will engage not only researchers and innovators, but also farmers, food business operators and consumers. I will give, uh, for us, an example is a partnership candidate on safe and sustainable food system for people, planet and climate. We see it as an important contributor. Thank you, Natalie, for your thoughts there, um, particularly focusing as well on uh, what the European Commission is doing and, of course, representing DG Santa. Even if we can't see you, we can certainly hear you. I'm going to turn now to our MEP, Irene Tolleray. Irene, uh, your thoughts, your opening thoughts on this question of getting researchers and innovators more involved. We can't hear you. Yes, now you can hear me? Now we can hear you. Yeah, uh, researchers and innovators are key actors in the debate on sustainable uh, food systems. The new European Food Forum that I co-founded uh, with other members of the European Parliament pays big attention to scientific approach, as it is essential when we discuss about the future of our food policy. The European Food Forum is an open platform for a free dialogue between all the different stakeholders involved in agri-food, from producers to NGOs, including academics, researchers, and civil society at large. Uh, the stakes of the climate change face with the stakes of the demography, uh, the stakes of the circular economy. Uh, we need, uh, we have new illnesses developing in, in the agriculture, uh, so we need uh, new tools 
And we have never had so many uh, powerful tools at the moment. So it's very important that we uh, put the researchers, uh, researchers and innovators at the right place. They are the, 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 the guys that will bring the traditions of uh, tomorrow. Uh, the traditions of today are the innovations of yesterday. So we need now to uh, get that into a central position to be able to have uh, politicians who help and not slow down uh, processes. Uh, researchers and innovators are essential to fight against epidemics. They are essential to fight uh, and to reduce the exploitation of uh, natural resources, such as, as water, at, as uh, was said, but also all the stakes around the uh, uh, circular economy as uh, the brilliant example on the banana pin, uh, peel uh, yesterday was, uh, um, earlier on was uh, done. Uh, so that way we can meet society's uh, expectation. So we should give researchers and innovators more space in the political sphere. We should not forget that those experts are in a better position, position than politicians to answer some of the difficult challenges, especially those related to climate change and food safety. We need, however, to have a balance uh, in, uh, uh, in all the different interests. The LC economy should go hand in hand with the protection of the environment and uh, food uh, safety. Uh, the European Union has the highest food and environmental standards in the world, but we can improve our uh, policy. Uh, innovators and researchers are also essential to help farmers and all stakeholders to make their ecological transformation to help farmers comply with ambitious objectives of reducing the use of pesticides by 50% in 2030, by, uh, as proposed by the European Commission. And we need more investment in innovation and research to reach these uh, targets. Uh, research and innovation is not only for primary sectors, but also for the processing industry to develop new food ingredients, to improve production methods, to reach better ener energy efficiency, food quality and safety, and to adapt to new uh, consumer choices. Lastly, and not leastly, we have social uh, innovation that can really uh, help us. Uh, we need more brilliant scientists, like uh, the French Emmanuel Charpentier, sorry, I'm French, we are a chauvinist uh, country, uh, who has recently been awarded the Nobel Prize. Emmanuel Charpentier has discovered with another scientist, the American Jennifer A. Doudna, one of the gene technology that is called uh, gene scissor, CRISP-Cas9. This technology is and one and other new breeding techniques may have the potential to improve culture resilience against pests and climate phenomena. So it's very important that we keep a good focus on research and innovation and that we help uh, these, the result of this thrive and that we get the benefits from the research as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, we've heard from all our speakers on the panel, but now we're going to hear from the audience because via that tool that I've mentioned, via Slido, you've answered many questions. Well, you've answered many answers to one question, shall I say, which is what more can we do in terms of research and innovation? As we can see there, focus on r and funding on the key pathways for change is the absolute top. Uh, and in the last place, we have mobilized and increased private sector r and In between, it's a, it's a fairly, even-ish split between collaborating across silos, building capacity, and improving insights on food systems, and investing in social sciences. Diane, I want to come back to you again and get your reaction to that, not scientific, but, uh, but representative, I hope, poll of our audience. Um, they, they put uh, private uh, investment R&I rather low. Is that a surprise to you? It is actually a surprise to me, I have to say, because there's a tremendous amount of investment that is directed already within the private sector and probably could be with a bit more collective collaborative action, even better directed on these very key issues that we're talking about here. The investments made by companies together with academics and other institutions can be really meaningful in helping to move these system changes that we want to all achieve together. We know that companies often are researching on things that will direct their own strategy, but this here is really an opportunity to bring more of that funding together, I believe. I'd love to see interest in moving that up 
the lens of importance with the not just the folks that are here, but really how we think about working together to create this kind of change. We know from our members that there's a big appetite to engage and lean in and figure out what are the solutions that need to be made. There's a couple of reasons why there's such a willingness for this. One is it's a shared future. So it's very key to their own business strategies, as well as those of many of their stakeholders that we figure out how to preserve and protect the communities that we serve and that are so we are also dependent on for our value chains. These need to be improved win-win situations. There's also a real opportunity around reputation and trust building that can happen through this kind of work together. So I would love to try to dive in a little bit more and see where are these very specific opportunities. I think a lot of us would have some very clear ideas, but the real, the real strength comes when we think through it together. I think the Food Systems Summit, and Martin, I'm sure you'll build on this a bit, has a real opportunity for us to leverage what are the real game-changing solutions? How do we bring this type of investment into innovation? across all of these arenas to really accelerate the transformations that we know that we need to have. Well, well thank you for that, Diane. Let us, let us hear from Martin then, uh, build on what Diane has just said. Yeah, indeed. Um, I was just pinning down some words for the next intervention. And before Diane has said trust, I put it down as one word that shows that we are quite um, synchronized. I think. One of the things that we really need to address here is the different silos of expertise that we are having. Um, Christiana Figueres, um, who did the Paris Agreement, coined the word of radical cooperation. And I think we need to be prepared for radical cooperation and we need to be prepared to listen. Um, I've been now for several months working in the preparation of the Food Systems Summit and I have heard statements sometimes when I closed my eyes, I wasn't sure anymore whether that's a business leader or a civil society leader. I think we need to be prepared to be surprised and we need to be um, prepared to listen and not taking out the 20 year old megaphones and shouting at each other when basically everybody at the latest with the COVID crisis, but also with all of the climate impacts being all over us when everybody has really understood that food systems have to play a central part to create equity on this planet, that we will not have lasting peace on this planet when the equivalent of 80 jumbo jets in crew are dying every day on malnutrition and hunger, and when we are living way past our planetary boundaries. So I hope that this summit can really trigger the conversations and break down some barriers many of them actually in the hearts and minds of people. Back to you. I want to come on to this engagement with consumers or citizens as, as we are. Um, Nathalie Chazé, um, in the farm to fork strategy, how much involvement, how much e emphasis is given to engaging citizens or consumers? Um, a lot, actually. We see consumers and citizens are central to the success of the farm to fork strategy. Because the challenge cannot come only from farmers or food business operators. Uh, the consumers need to drive the change and they, they have the potential to support strongly the transition through their choice. And there are several concrete actions foreseen in the strategy to engage consumers and citizens in the future of the food system and the future of their food. The first, for instance, is about empowering consumers. So we will develop a number of labeling solutions to facilitate informed, healthy, and sustainable food choice. Uh, I will give a few examples. We have the plan Front of Park Nutrition Labeling for the health uh, information. Uh, we are also planning a sustainable labeling framework to inform with the sustainability more comprehensively of food. Um, we talk about origin. There are also actions to address availability and affordability of sustainable food, which is important because not all uh, consumer, some consumers are very sensitive to food price. And we try to create an, a food environment which is favorable, which will nudge consumers toward healthy and sustainable diets. 
But at the end of the day, it's the consumer who makes the choice. And they, from that point of view, they are really essential. I'd say there is another way to engage citizens. Um, we will organize public consultation when we will prepare the legislative proposal, all the legislation uh, identified in the action plan for farm to fork. These are open consultation. They will provide opportunities for all citizens or consumer association, but also researchers, to share their views on reactor ideas, and we really hope they will be fully engaged. Thank you. Um, Irene, let me ask you, um, from the perspective of the European Food Forum, what priority actions can be taken to help engage community, citizens, consumers, if we want to call them that? Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much for us. It's one of uh, the reasons we created uh, the European Food Forum. We thought that uh, if we want to deliver, we can't do it without the, uh, the NGOs and uh, without the uh, consumers, because we have to uh, build a dialogue. All the issues where uh, consumers uh, do not understand uh, why we have reached uh, this situation where we have a hunger and, and we use too much the planet, then there are explanations. And if we want to uh, change from that, we need to have a dialogue with all the stakeholders. This is why from the beginning in the European Food Forum, we have uh, NGOs and uh, we want to have more NGOs to, to, to discuss on, uh, on pesticides, on uh, all the, the different components that uh, will lead us to uh, better uh, deliver a better health on a, on a protected uh, planet. So um, it's also very important because we are at the time of uh, social media and sometimes uh, uh, very complicated evolutions cannot be summarized in a few words. So you really need to have uh, the citizens that uh, uh, are uh, uh, in, interested in these policies to be represented and to uh, be part of uh, uh, the public uh, discussion. And that, I think, is at every level. So, of course, at the level of the European Food for All, but also, uh, as uh, was said previously, with a consultation by the Commission, but also, as uh, the leader approach does uh, uh, through Europe uh, in uh, local uh, communities, because the best way is uh, to discuss, to understand, and, uh, and, and to move uh, uh, together. Uh, the European Food Forum is therefore structured to give a very important uh, role to civil society, and uh, we are very happy to have researchers and members, and we would love to have more participation uh, from the CSOs. Uh, in addition to MEP founders, academics take an equal part of discussion, and I think it's very important that all the speeches be heard, because that's, for me, the only way for us to uh, move forward uh, at maybe a little uh, pace at the time, but one in front of the other, because we have only one planet, and uh, food is so important. I think that access to a good food, good for the planet, is a, a fundamental human right for all European citizens, but planet-wise too. And for that, we need the consumers' representation and civil society to help us. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning the academic side, because we're going to come on to that shortly as we have a question come in from our audience. But first, let me turn to Emma Chow. Emma, do you actively engage consumers with regard to the future of their food? And, you know, is that an essential or is that just a nice to have? Yeah, great question. So we as a foundation primarily are working with the system actors because we, while we recognize that consumer choices, of course, are important, what's even more important is that the, the food environments that were spoken of just moments earlier and that are created by the industry players, by the policymakers and others, allow citizens to express their values in their everyday choices of what's on the grocery store's shelves or what's on their restaurant menus. So in that case, we're prim primarily focused on how we shift the system and working within the industry um, and with those enabling factors like policymakers and, and innovators. But at the same time, it's good to highlight the importance of civil society in terms of generating public pressure on key issues that are 
deeply intertwined with food, like the links with climate and food, biodiversity and food, water and food, and human health and food, and so on. And last year, we ran a campaign actually on World Food Day where we asked these simple questions of saying, what if your breakfast could build biodiversity? What if the solution to climate change could actually be delicious and move the collective mindset into a space of positive impact? And I think that's that's something that's really important, especially as it comes to steering and influencing research and innovation, is that we're not just doing innovation for innovation's sake, but actually are all steering towards a common vision and common set of goals. And we're moving to, towards a similar direction or the same direction, actually. Thank you. Um, now, we have a question come in via Slido, which is asking about the academic system and asking whether it is fit for purpose to breed the next generation of scientists to handle the food system's science and complexity, because that is what we are talking about today. We're talking about transformation. Surely there needs to be the skills there to allow us to drive that transformation. Uh, perhaps you could reflect on that, please, Martin. Oh, sorry, I was muted. I think that's the sentence of 2020. Sorry, <laughs> I was muted. Um, no, I, I, I'm not an expert in, 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 in science, but I can tell you that what I have seen so far is engagement from young people is so encouraging. And there's a generation I feel growing up that are systems thinkers just by virtue of having grown up in the reality of climate change. Look at the leadership young people have taken in the streets on climate change. They have maybe moved more than 10 years of negotiation process in one year. And, you know, I want to connect that to two points that were just made. Irene spoke about the right-based approach, about a human rights-based approach. And it, food is a basic human right, you know. And in preparing the summit, we will be working with Michael Fakri, the special rapporteur on the right to food. And this is also something that we hear so strongly from young people that they say, well, we are not begging for something. We have rights and we want our rights to be realized. And on Emma's point, you know, how is your breakfast contributing to biodiversity? I think it's the broader approach to a good life, to this human aspiration of a good life that it's driving young people. So, you know, I'm in a hiring process. I'm just filling three positions. And young people are now asking the question, can I work from home? Can I manage to see my parents? Is there a work-life balance? And in that holistic view of life, not just trying to put yourself in an air channel and streamline yourself in a way that some HR director finds you interesting, but really thinking about how do I live my life to the fullest? Um, I think that is something that I don't only see with young researchers. And I recently spoke um, at the Young Academy in the Leop Leopoldina University. But this is something I really see with so many young people around the globe. And that really, I find most energizing and inspiring. Um, Natalie, now I believe we can see you, so I'll put the question to you as well. I mean, is there something that could be done at EU policy level to encourage the skills that are going to be needed for this transformation? Can you hear us? I think what we need, yeah, I can hear you. I think what, what we need to look at really is how to have the proper skills to help develop research that can be translated into solution for our food system. Like we, we probably need to, to move, uh, the, to change a bit how we translate knowledge of research finding into solution for sustainable food system. And for that reason, perhaps we need to work more closely with a young, young researcher and promote the skill of when we develop research projects, they also cater for the needs of the regulatory science. Well, it might be a little bit of a different uh, skill. It's not research for research. We perhaps need to look at researchers who look at research to support regulators in their work. Thank you. I'm going to take another question from Slido. It's an interesting one, presumably in light of the current pandemic. 
Are there trade-offs in regard to resilience of the food systems and its sustainability? Um, let me put that one to Diane. It's a very interesting question and certainly a very timely one. It's a super important question because COVID really has shown, as I think I may have said, a really bright light on the inequities and the weaknesses of the food system. There, are, we, there was a lot of research that we did in looking at what makes for a strong response and where are the weakest points in the system and how do we have to address that? What we saw as we were looking at that challenge is that it's, it's insufficient to look at only one thing. So we saw challenges in farm fields where there wasn't enough movement of people to be able to harvest crops. We saw challenges in storage where there wasn't enough ship and air movement to actually move the harvested food to the countries and the locations that need it the most. We saw real challenges in refrigeration and refrigerated workplace environments that we saw actually accelerate the spread of this horrific illness. We also saw on the other side, such dramatic shifts relative to increases in poverty, increases in nutrition insecurity, and lack of access to nutritious foods because of the dramatic loss of incomes for so many people across the supply chains. These are the things that when you, we think about what does it mean to build forward in a resilient way and address these challenges in our system, we have to be more thoughtful. What are the impacts of a truly global supply chain? How would we start to regionalize some of these um, crops or ingredients that we rely on? Is that the right solution? What are the implications for the farmers who are depending on the income for those crops in other countries? We are, we, you know, it's been said here, we have to bring a systems approach. And I think COVID has really, really shown that as well. So we saw a couple of priorities in this. We saw that we need to be able to lean in and assure that there is sufficient cash flow moving through the food systems, particularly to farmers and small medium enterprises at the local levels who are involved in processing, harvesting, storage, moving or even shelves, stocking shelves for that matter, we saw that we really need to address how supply chains are constructed and what's the work to be really thought through if these kinds of disruptions occur again, which we know they're likely to do as we look at the risks and these, these closer, alliance, these closer uh, challenges of zoonotic disease, biodiversity loss and human health and pandemics. So there's a number of steps that we need to take. I think that trade-offs isn't the right way to go. We need to consider what the implications are. We need to think about the co-benefits and we need to think about what are the tough solutions that really will assure equity and stability for resilience across the system. Thank you. I'm gonna, I, want the, I would like uh, to hear Irene and uh, Emma's thoughts on this question as well. Irene, is there a trade-off between resilience and sustainability? Uh, I, I would like to, to, to come back on what was just said. Uh, with the, the COVID uh, crisis, um, we have uh, really uh, uh, come to face uh, the domino effect of all our policies. Because uh, usually uh, when you work in agriculture in the European Parliament, you work on food, but then uh, uh, you do not uh, uh, consider that suddenly a pandemic would uh, stop uh, all trucks moving, and then that you would have uh, uh, chocolate or milk trucks that are that are stuck somewhere in a, in a, in, a, in a, between in a border, and that uh, could uh, not be used anymore. So um, uh, it's uh, very important that uh, we uh, now challenge all uh, uh, the policy that we are going to do with the fact that we need a holistic approach and that uh, pandemic do exist. So it's very important that we work on European sovereignty, which does not mean that uh, it's protectionism, but that uh, not only every uh, citizen must have access to uh, good food, but this access must be kept uh, in, uh, in terms of pandemic and also if they lose their job. Because uh, of course, the uh, economic crisis of uh, COVID now makes that the 
hunger that can develop in uh, Europe is a more link to the economic uh, 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 pro problems, which are not part of the uh, agriculture committee at all. So it's very important that we work on a holistic approach to, um, to learn and, uh, and uh, to better deliver on, on sustainability. Thank you. Emma, our two previous respondents have shied away from the words trade-off. That was the, the word used in the question sent in by the audience member. What's your take on it? I don't see trade-offs at all. I actually see potential for design, re fundamental redesign of the system, putting resilience at the center of that, and actually the nature-based solutions that need to be the heart of it, which would include growing food in actually regenerative ways. So that means actively building biodiversity, actively building healthy soils. And when you do that, you get a multitude of benefits. So you move from this if scenario, if I optimize biodiversity, if I optimize cost, if I optimize emissions to an and, I can optimize all of these if we design the solutions appropriately. Mm -hmm. And when we, again, taking the case of regenerative food production, when we use those methods, it actually means that you have healthy soils that are more resilient to climate change shocks, right? And so when the storm comes along or when drought comes along, if you have healthy soils that can hold water in a much more effective way, it is a better able to sustain the crops, avoid crop failing, and also support farmer livelihoods short and long-term. So for me, that is a clear example of, yes, there takes investment and there's a shift and there's knowledge sharing and all of that that needs to be in place to allow regenerative production in a widespread way. But that create, that's a scenario where you're creating a multitude of benefits across all domains. And then if you also apply other aspects of what people often refer to as sustainability in, in the food system. So shorter supply chains, that's been something highlighted, right? And we know in today's glo hyper-globalized um, homogenous systems, we need to restrike the balance and have more diversity of the sourcing, sourcing models. So we need a balance between what's grown and, and sourced from near, but also far away. Um, because at the same time, you don't want to have 100% from local because if a shock comes along, a storm comes along, you're completely wiped out. Um, and then finally, on the waste side of things, let's imagine a future where, where it was mentioned earlier, a post-waste society. What if waste wasn't even in our language? And as we see in circular economy, it's about saying that there, we're not only regenerating natural systems in the way that we're growing our food, but we're also making the most of food because all parts of food have value. So if we're able to capture those resources, we're not only mitigating the negative harm that they're creating today, but we're actually taking what used to be waste streams and turning them into value streams, revenue streams, new, entire new business models can be made out of it. So that again creates resilience in the, in the different types of businesses that are being created, um, less dependence on extracting finite resources. So for me, there's, there's just so many benefits if that can be created and trade-offs doesn't even need to be um, a point of contention. Okay, good to have some consensus there from our panel. Now, I'm glad you mentioned uh, supply chains uh, because although today is the Food 2030 EU conference, it's also World Food Day. And I want to take a question that's come in from David Allen about stretching ourselves beyond the EU. Local and indigenous nutritional knowledge is so critical. How can more research funds find their way to developing countries to improve options for everyone? Martin, I'm gonna ask you to respond to that. Thank you very much. I seem to get all the hard questions. Um, can I abuse my speaking time just to very strongly agree with what Emma just said? There are no trade-offs. It is really synergies. And I would highly recommend to look at some videos, for example, of this year's World Food Prize winner, um, Ratan Lal, who was so instrumental in understanding soil organic carbon. And maybe soils, healthy soils and carbon in soils is the prime example of actually synergies and creating a better system of agriculture. We had wasted so many years in climate change to speak about climate change measures versus development, which is utter nonsense. There is a synergy between them. And what has climate change has created in technology is the biggest opportunity, I think, for some of the least developed countries 
out there. But now to indigenous knowledge. Yes, absolutely. And the summit will harness indigenous knowledge on the same eye level like the latest research. And I think that is extremely important because if you look at our food systems, we are so dependent from a handful of staple crops that are being more and more and more refined, but we are neglecting the development of vegetables, of indigenous foods, of the whole variety of that. If you consider that on the US market by 1914, you had 125 different varieties of apples and today you got six different varieties. That also gives you a, a lesson about the vulnerability of the system and you know, the lack of nutritional value of that. So yes, indeed, we have to listen to indigenous peoples and we have to use their knowledge and support research in harnessing that by all means. Back to you. See, you were nodding along with a lot of what Martin said. Perhaps you'd like to, to give your thoughts on this topic as well, indigenous knowledge and how to get um, RNI funding to developing countries. Um, I think with our agenda, as I say, it's, it, we have developed with the Farm to Fox strategy an agenda for the EU contribution to the global shift toward uh, sustainable food system because it is essential in order to combat uh, efficiently climate change to protect the planet as uh, Dr. Van Horn has said for planet and people. We are fully aware that this is an agenda designed by the EU for the EU so it's related also to our um, to our situation but we know that we cannot succeed alone so we need all uh, we need a global shift to a sustainable food system, but this it doesn't mean there is one size fits for all approach. So we indeed, that's why all researchers and all policy need to look at the situation in all countries and in developing countries in particular to find what is the best solution for them to support the shift. And I think in the EU, we are committed to uh, engage with our country and to provide support to developing countries who want to uh, also build sustainable food system where I think some of them are, have systems which are even less resilient and more at risk of climate change than ours, even though we are only seeing the difference on the ground already in the EU. Thank you. Irene, what is your take on the, this, pod, this question about uh, how do we leverage, I think is, is, is the angle, how do we leverage indigenous knowledge uh, through funding to developing countries? I think uh, it's uh, one of the key issues because uh, uh, human beings, uh, be them in Africa or in, uh, in Europe, if uh, they have a hunger problem, if their children die of uh, hunger, then they will move. Nobody would stay in a place where you risk that. So it's important that we help, and the uh, European Union has been uh, uh, quite helpful on the subject of uh, water uh, with uh, uh, third world countries. And I think now we need to uh, tackle the subject of uh, food in helping uh, these countries, uh, maybe more uh, um, through uh, uh, to build even better and more resistant in indigenous uh, um, uh, food systems. Uh, we come from uh, the, la the, the last uh, 50 years, it was a globalization time. So uh, it was a uh, one size fits all. If, uh, we, if corn is a, is a good uh, thing uh, for uh, uh, American citizens, then corn is the solution for all the planet. I think that now we need to come back to, uh, if I am uh, in, a, in a place where I have a hunger problem, what are the best uh, food systems that can be developed so that uh, everybody can uh, live a healthy life. Uh, of course, uh, as I am um, in the European Parliament, I would say that uh, this help uh, still must, uh, we cannot uh, uh, help uh, anti-democratic uh, or uh, things to develop. So uh, human rights must be uh, uh, kept uh, and women rights must be kept somewhere along the line. But uh, I think it's very important. And, even the farm to fork strategy in the end, uh, uh, I believe in a locally managed uh, European food systems.
that's uh, I mean, if you look in Finland compared to Spain, compared to uh, Minneapolis uh, or Tokyo, uh, the, the, the food system that will be the most resilient will have nothing to do. The soil is not the same. The, uh, the culture is not the same. The water is not the same. The uh, impact of the climate change is not the same. The uh, level of the population is not the same. So we need to work together. Uh, politicians, lawmakers, researchers, we need the researchers and, uh, and, and to build a resilient food system. And of course, the European Union should be a champion to help those who have so much uh, food problem and hunger problem now. Well, you mentioned again the farm to fork strategy, and you may have heard I asked the professor a question earlier, which is really essentially the top question that has also come through from our audience on Slido, and it is, is the EU farm to fork strategy ambitious enough? Do we need more targets? Do we need dedicated action on research and innovation? Diana, I'll let you answer it first, but I would like to get a response from every one of our panelists on this question. I think the EU farm to fork strategy has to be ambitious. I think it's making some really strong strides. I think the th what I find most exciting and what we see as the biggest opportunity is that although this is by Europe for Europe, I mean, as the, I think you just said, it actually has real global opportunity because Europe is such a strong trader across the globe. And there's a real opportunity for this farm to fork strategy, therefore, to have a very meaningful ripple effect on lifting all ships on what this opportunity represents. So while it's incredibly important for Europe and we really like what we're starting to see, we want the ambition to be high. And we want to also think about how we use that opportunity to really think through trade and other types of agreements how we can leverage that into other markets as well. Is the farm to fork strategy ambitious enough? Um, if so, why? If not, what more is needed? Emma? Oh, sorry, I couldn't okay. hear you at the very beginning. <laughs> Wasn't sure if it was just me. Yeah, no, just to echo what Diane just emphasized, I think the direction that it's headed is, is very, very positive. And really what when we talk about where the level of ambition is, for me, it's really this movement from today's what we'll call linear paradigm, which is a very degrading, damaging system. And let's make sure that the strategy and the policies that are put in place aren't about undoing or minimizing damage because that will only get us so far and ultimately that's treating symptoms of an underlying problem. But actually can the articulated articulation of the language and ensuing policies actually be around a higher level of, of ambition that is about a fundamental shift to a new paradigm which is fully harnessing the potential for food to be a powerful positive force. And so even to see the, the language of regenerative, you know, moving from sustainable to regenerative actually in documents and circular economy and taking out, taking out the waste altogether, um, those are all really positive. And I do believe this can be a really, really important signaling um, to the rest of the world and catalyze much quicker momentum because we know the scale of the challenges that we're facing um, demand a, the, a pace that is a bit quicker than we're moving at currently. Natalie, I am sure you will say that, of course, the farm to fork strategy is ambitious enough. But could you also talk about for us the targets and the targeted action that maybe is needed with the R&I area? We think our farm to fork strategy is indeed an ambitious agenda, but a necessary agenda. So we have proposed, yes, concrete targets and actions, you know, targets on reduction of use and risk of pesticides, targets to ensure prudent use of antimicrobial, targets to increase the share of organic production, target on the use of fertilizer. So we have really challenging targets which have been presented. 
and what we're looking at for the moment is some support like it's not just a commission uh, strategy it must be an eu strategy so next week the council uh, will adopt council conclusion farm to fox strategy we are will know looking forward to the report from the european parliament we like to hear stakeholders as well we had uh, organizing we were organizing conference also this week so what we need to do now and we think it's important is to ensure a successful implementation and we will need the buy-in of all uh, of all and we know that some are worried about the because changes bring opportunity but for some they also bring risk what is important for us is to see action for all actors because it's a system approach it's not agriculture it's not just consumer it's all along the food chain but I mean, the reception of the farm to fox strategy showed that yes, we've been ambitious, we think it's necessary, and we hope to have all support at all levels to implement it. And for that, research are indeed an innovator will be indeed essential. Um, well, of course, to carry out the task. Of course, you do need the buy-in of the European Parliament. So let's hear then from one MEP, Irene, your, uh, your take on whether the Farm to Fork strategy is ambitious enough. Um, I come from uh, the country of uh, rugby, so I do not know if uh, the uh, strategy is ambitious enough, but I am concentrated in uh, delivering on it with all the stakeholders. Because uh, at the moment, we can draw our heart off to what the Commission is doing. We have the farm to fork strategy, we have the new Green Deal, we have the biodiversity strategy, we just came out of the forest strategy. So really, the Commission is uh, putting on the table the tools to change uh, not only the food system, but the way the European Union in general uh, uh, um, uses the environment. And, uh, and, and that's really uh, fantastic and needs to be underlined. Uh, on the farm to fork uh, strategy, we will deliver if uh, we uh, tackle the different, uh, the difficult uh, solutions. Because, of course, on something, everybody agrees. We agree to. Uh, uh, decrease pesticides. The question is, what do we need to authorize to reach these targets? And when we come to this question, there is a, a, a real need to have researchers explain what they can deliver and have uh, citizens and all the components of uh, uh, the, our society that understand that if we want the target, we need to have the means to reach the target, because otherwise it will be um, thinking that uh, we have a, a nice uh, farm to fork strategy. And I think our issue now is to deliver. And for that, uh, everybody is welcome on board, especially in the European Food Forum. That is exactly why we have been created. I will give a, a very a short example. Uh, Nathalie spoke about the council. So inside the farm to fork strategy and all these very good strategy, we have the uh, circular uh, uh, economy and reducing food waste. So we can have all the European strategies and laws we want. Uh, waste collect, waste at the moment is a member state strategy. So if we do not, and of course, the way the waste is collected in all the different countries is not at all the same. So on one hand, we have a, a European size or global players that distribute the food. Uh, we have a packaging uh, that uh, is uh, maybe more um, uh, European side than, uh, and then we have food that is produced locally that needs to be processed. But if we look at the waste, then it's member state and it's done in a different way. If we want to deliver on the farm to fork strategy, everybody needs to uh, follow on the, and, and be on board to reach the objectives. Thank you. Well, we talk an awful lot here in Brussels about member state competencies, and it's worth pointing out that, that just simply means it's up to national governments to look after that specific aspect. Um, but Martin, I want to get your response to that question. It was our top question coming from the audience today. Is the EU farm to fork strategy ambitious enough? Do we need specific targets or targeted action on R&I? Thank you. I, I think it's definitely an inspiration for the world. There's a lot of talk about the EU farm to fork strategy, and I'm very happy that the EU is very substantially um, engaging with all of our five action tracks, which is the thinking machine, not only as commission, but also as member states. 
But I want to say something not only about the what, but about the how. And Irene made this point for the systems approach. And I think this is really significant because on the UN level, these days are not easy for multilateral diplomacy. But the way we engage this idea of inclusive multilateralism using the UN, not only for member states to negotiate, but bringing everybody in is essential for the very future of the UN. And I could see that for the EU, being a European myself, you know, the farm to fork strategy, the Green New Deal is also creating something extremely precious, which is a new identity for the European Union um, to be on the way to becoming an entirely sustainable continent. And that is a vision that is inspiring young people. And that injects new energy into this wonderful idea of European unification. So the significance of it is really political and it's much bigger than the subject matter in itself. And I think, you know, there's an emotional quality about food and identity value about food. There's this wonderful French word that you can't translate into English, which is terroir the idea of the people, the tradition, the food that grows there, all of that, this identity. And I think it's fantastic to bring that on an EU level and it's truly inspirational. I think now we're reaching the end of our panel discussion, but I probably have time for one more question to each of our panelists. So Diane, um, you're managing director of food and nature at the World Business Council. So you're helping the private sector to contribute to transformative change. So I think this question from our uh, audience is probably good for you. And which is how can social scientific knowledge influence industry standards and the production processes? I think that they're very linked actually it's interesting you know if you are part of a consumer facing organization you use social sciences all the time because that's the nature of what's driving marketing and brand types of campaigns i think what we haven't necessarily done enough is leveraging some of that social science back in through innovation some organizations are doing that but i think there's a real opportunity to think about how do we use social science social insights the ethnography aspects of that to really influence how we work through innovation, different types of solutions and leverage that into different types of partnerships. Where we see some of our member companies doing that, we get some really exciting results. There tends to be a real rethinking around what kinds of solutions are brought to market. And the thing that gets so important about that is that they tend to then also be more compatible with some of the policymaker guidance and some of the other things that we need in the social infrastructure. So we see a real opportunity. I think it would be really intriguing to think about how do we formalize that a bit more. Thank you. Um, turning to Emma, um, given that you're working on healthy regenerative food systems, um, I have a question here saying that we do not need much more research and innovation in organic food systems. Uh, we shouldn't be targeting that already. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, I think something that's important to note is when we look at the spectrum of farming from more conventional, very intensive industrial extractive methods to what is ultimately the purest form of regenerative, there's organic, which some organic can be regenerative, but most organic labels and certifications are about um, minimizing or eliminating agrochemical inputs. But that doesn't necessarily um, mandate or, or mean that you need to be using some other regenerative practices, which can include things like cover cropping, multi-cropping, um, crop rotations, cover crops, I <laughs> love crop words, um, and tilling, reducing or no tilling, and so that's, I think, important is, yes, there has been research around organic and organic had very good pure intentions decades ago when it was first rolled out. But unfortunately, it has in some places, in some instances, been diluted in its integrity. And you can have um, quite a bit of in what can be referred to as industrial organic. So it's not necessarily actively supporting ecosystems. And there's a need to go beyond beyond that. And we see folks even like the 
Rodale Institute who pioneered the organic label decades ago coming out with the um, regenerative organic certification scheme, which is now, I think just rounding out or maybe completed its first pilot with several brands, um, both fashion and food brands around the world. Uh, related obviously to the uh, UN Food Systems Summit next year. What do you expect, what do you want from R&I researchers, what, what the R&I community really, what do you want input from them? I, I think very much connecting the dots. We have so deep expertise in very different fields. I mean, look at the question of soil organic carbon that, that Emma brought up, and it's such an important issue. We have breakthroughs in sensor technology. Sensor is really becoming cheap. We got blockchain technology to push out small amounts of money without losing in, in efficiencies. We have, and that's a European ESA project, we have the new Sentinel satellites that have super high resolution infrared response. We need to bring all of that together to really come to a system in which we can honor and honorate farmers for improving their soil organic carbon. I understand that the World Bank is changing, for example, the incentive structure from outputs to soil health. We can support that and we need to look at the interlinkages of different technologies and look at the big picture, how these different things can come together. And that really requires a systems approach. And whenever people of one discipline speak to others, the magic is happening. Just remember the first, um, the keynote that Professor von Braun gave, the little blue explosions where innovation can take place. That's always between spaces of expertise. So I hope that these multidisciplinary approaches can be promoted and that we can really bring together researchers from different areas of expertise um, with this vision of reinventing agriculture. And also, you know, and I want to say a word for restoration, really using this more than 50% of the world's land that is moderately to severely degraded, degraded and see it as an opportunity, as an investment opportunity. This is the new sort of frontier economy to regain this land into agricultural use and to make it a driver of um, biodiversity and of carbon sequestration. Thank you. Natalie, you mentioned earlier on uh, public consultation. What do you, at DG Sante, what sort of input do you want as policymakers? In the public consultation, uh, at the beginning of each uh, initiative, we will open a public consultation based on a roadmap or document which identify a bit the different option and the way forward. So when it will be extremely useful for us to have the feedback of citizens, of researchers, or consumers, of who is interested into what they see is the best approach to reach the goal we are all looking for through this initiative. So it will come via the action plan on farm to fork contains a number of initiatives and we need to have the feedback from all from a social angle economy a climate change specialist all all uh, expertise and all skills are welcome uh, to contribute to the development of this policy and this is what we'll do at eu level but will be equally important i think at global level and then last but not least, Irene, from your perspective, from the European Food Forum, what is it you want to hear from the, uh, the researchers, the innovators, the whole community? Um, uh, uh, I want, uh, yeah, uh, I think that uh, uh, putting answers uh, to questions we have uh, is uh, already uh, something uh, important. Uh, Sometimes we need uh, more data. Uh, sometimes we need to have an uh, impact assessment and things like that. So I think that uh, it's important that uh, we fund uh, research and innovation. Uh, as I said earlier on, uh, we need to stop being afraid about uh, research and innovation because uh, they are in uh, 100 times, 100 years time, things that today we call uh, innovation will be called 
tradition. So it's very important that we help identify uh, these uh, tools because uh, that's part of uh, uh, human history to always adapt and, uh, and go forward. So uh, I think it's uh, what I expect from uh, research and innovation is to come uh, forward with an uh, idea to solve the problems that are on the, on the table and that we can help fund and then try to identify solutions and fund uh, the solution uh, test and uh, also uh, um, explain to everybody on board, including citizens, that these innovations need to be agreed in the law. Because at the moment, we have a sort of a dream that uh, food systems were a lot better in the 16th century. Uh, it was absolutely not the case, neither in terms of uh, the production. We were using things like uh, uh, arsenic uh, and very bad uh, things that now we don't use anymore. I think that our food is uh, better than it uh, was a long time ago, and we need to improve its uh, not only its nutritional uh, uh, quality, but it's also its environmental uh, uh, quality. So I hope that the researchers and innovators can help us uh, go forward on that, explain uh, what uh, they propose, and that, that we can implement and deliver on the farm to fork strategy. Thank you very much uh, for your thoughts. And indeed, thank you to all our panel, to Natalie, Martin, Emma, Diane, and Irene. Thank you. We've had, and thank you at home as well and in your offices and watching around Europe for all your questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but that's because there were so many and so many of you logged on, which is a very heartening sign to see that World Food Day and Food 2030 EU is garnering an awful lot of interest. But we are approaching the end of today's event, and I'm going to hand over now to Patrick Child from the European Commission, DG Research and Innovation, Deputy Director General, standing in today for the Commission. Patrick, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. And I don't know whether someone wants to put on my camera because it's been turned off here. But otherwise, I will just talk. Huh? No, here we go. Thank you. So that is a bonus today, obviously. It's a learning curve for all of us doing all these things remotely, but I think uh, we're getting there, and I think we're we can see you we're now as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, well, look, uh, thank you very much for that welcome. And uh, uh, dear Professor Van Vaughan, dear members of the panel, and, and uh, dear everybody participating, it's a great pleasure for me to um, share some final remarks at the end of this inspiring and forward-looking conference. As you've said, um, Commissioner Maria Gabriel would have very much liked to be here today, but unfortunately, because of sickness, uh, she had to pull out at the last minute. Um, but for me, uh, this conference has emphasized again on World Food Day that our food system is truly at the center of our existence. It sustains us, it links us with our planet, it provides us with jobs and prosperity, it's part of our culture and an important expression of our creativity and diversity. Securing a sustainable future for our food system is a task of strategic importance, and this has been underlined by the recent COVID-19 crisis. And here, therefore, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate the World Food Programme for receiving the Nobel Peace Prize this year. It's of crucial importance that we use the full potential of research and innovation to accelerate food system transformation. This is at the core of our EU policy response. In particular, the European Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy, and the next generation EU uh, post COVID recovery package. It's also a central part of the European Commission's bioeconomy strategy and action plan. And I'd like to thank our partners, uh, the FAO and the German Ministry of Education and Research, for helping us in projecting the importance of research and innovation today. I'd like to emphasize that we are going to mobilize and support the community of researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs in the European Union and beyond. Um, just so you know, I'm keeping an eye on that 1422 down there rather than this countdown because it's a little While busy. leaving nobody behind as we strive to recover from the COVID crisis. So, Specifically, we want to do two, three things. We want to invest. Visuals to show that we, can... we want to mobilize and strengthen evidence. So firstly on investment, we will invest to 
to enable food system transformation. On the 18th of September, the European Commission launched a 1 billion euro Green Deal call. It includes 74 million euros for investments to pilot and demonstrate systemic solutions in support of the farm to fork strategy. It will tackle issues of pollution, food waste, climate change, biodiversity loss, and unhealthy diets. This is the first important research and innovation delivery in support of the European Green Deal. In addition, we're now preparing for the first biannual work program of our next research and innovation framework program, Horizon Europe. And this will include ambitious calls related to food systems. Now, part of our work on Horizon Europe, we are preparing five missions, including one on soil health and food, to deliver real solutions for citizens in every part of the European Union. Another important investment opportunity will be the COVID-19 recovery package, Next Generation EU. This is an opportunity to green our economy, with 37% concentrated on our European Green Deal objectives. This huge investment will help to shape our future food systems for sustainability, climate, health, and inclusion, and to deploy the vision of a sustainable and bio, uh, sustainable and circular bioeconomy. Secondly, we will mobilize researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs, especially the young generation, to bring new insights and co-create breakthrough solutions for our food systems. We will use the DG Research and Innovation-led Food 2030 initiative to build capacity for real system change in 10 key pathways for action. We will use the learnings of the Fit for Food 2030 project, which mobilized many multi-actor policy labs across Europe to connect and inspire food system stakeholders and communities. We will apply the new European research area to foster a spirit of cooperation and alignment and to promote excellence-based research and innovation in each member state. We will advance open science and open research data in the scientific fields related to food systems. We will de deploy innovation and invest where people live, work and eat through partnerships like the EIT Food or the Smart Specialization Platform Agri-Food. Finally, we will launch a new 600,000 euro study to advise us on how to strengthen education and training in food systems and the wider bioeconomy. My third theme is on the need to strengthen the evidence base on food system transformation. Today, we still lack the necessary insights and understanding of our food system to address the systemic problems that they face. We need to advance food system science and in particular address the deficit in the social sciences that the EU's scientific advice mechanism highlighted in a report on sustainable food earlier this year. In addition, we need to ask ourselves whether practices, approaches and governance can accelerate food system transformation. Europe is well positioned to lead on this work globally. And for this reason, our commissioner will task a high level expert group to see how the evidence base on food systems and their governance can be strengthened as targeted input to the 2021 UN World Food Systems Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, we need the full potential of research and innovation to help us future-proof our food systems and balance economy, society, and environment with the three dimensions of sustainability within our planetary boundaries. We are committed to this task, and we will ensure that the three action areas deliver on the EU Green Deal, and in particular, on the farm to fork strategy. These would be European contributions to the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit and to a global ambition for a deep food system transformation. And therefore, in conclusion, I urge researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs to join these efforts to grow, nourish, and sustain our food systems together. To finish by quoting the FAO slogan for World Food Day today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick Child from the European Commission, and thank you for standing in for the Commissioner for us um, at short notice. Very much appreciated by our audience and by ourselves here.
Now we are in the final stages. We have got some visualizations for you, as I promised to sort of recap on the day. And joining me back in the studio again, I have John Bell. Welcome back, John. I know you were watching closely everything that was said. Um, let's have a look at what we've got in terms of those visualizations. Have we got them? We've had a graphic artist working on what we've been talking about. But John, while we're waiting for those, ah, we have it. There we go. Um, that is very impressive. Can I get your reaction, John? How can R and I accelerate the ongoing food systems transformation towards sustainability? We've got challenges. We've got engagement. We've got ending food hunger, zero hunger by 2030. Is it possible? No, it's going to happen. It's uh, it's it's not possible. It's within reach. It's essential. Uh, if we're going to end hunger, we've got to start the new food system fast, which is what this summit is about next year. And if you look at the diagram of the drawings, you see a sense of how we're going to do it. You have to mobilize everybody. You have to bring, as Joachim von Braun was saying, you have to get the investment on board. You need to align uh, where the European Union is, which is about this transformative process towards sustainability and, and climate neutrality with what our member states are doing. We need to work in terms of partnership internationally. We need to do what the diagram is doing, which is to bring the different parts of the story together and the different actors together, um, whether it's the, the people who need to ensure that the governance of the food system is, is fairer, or in this diagram, when we look at the investment, the mobilization, the strengthening, which is a theme that's been coming out uh, all through this, uh, di this discussion. So I think it's not, uh, the, the issue is not whether we're going to do this. We, we will have no choice. Thank you, and thank you there to our graphic designer. I think we've seen two slides. Do we have any others? Invest, mobilize, strengthen. I particularly like the strengthen one with its uh, microscope and uh, showing us what can happen in the future. So those images will be available for everyone to share on social media. So please do spread them around. Use the hashtag Food2030EU, and also particularly today on World Food Day. But it's not the end of the conversation because, of course, this will continue on into the indefinite future. John, any closing thoughts before we say goodbye and let people know where they can find videos and so on? I think at this moment that we're living through, we've realized that most of our assumptions are probably not true about the future. And that can be a positive thing. I think what we've seen in this conversation today is we know where we need to get to. We have the means. We have the community. In the European Union, we have the commitment of a continent to make it happen in terms of our responsibility. And what we need from you now is to take the Pathways documents, look at the conversation today, connect, uh, discuss, read, come back and talk to us as we make this journey over the next year to the UN uh, Summit on Food Sustainability, and ask your political leaders and policy leaders to mobilize the resources and to connect up the policies with the investors and the innovators to make it happen. And um, We said a few years ago, Jennifer, when we started this process off in the Expo, there is no security without food security. There's no food security without food and nutrition security. And there's no food and nutrition security without sustainable food systems. And today we can add there'll be no sustainable food systems without researchers and innovators stepping up to imagine what they will look like for people, for places, for planet. Pour le terroir aussi. Thank you very much, John. Thank you also to the organizers of today's event, the European Commission, the German Presidency, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, without whose support we wouldn't have had this great event. Thank you all for tuning in, many, many hundreds of you, dozens and dozens of questions. So I know this is engaged widely across Europe and, and even beyond. So thank you for our, your participation. We will share lots of the videos. We will share lots of the contributions. We have recorded all of this, and we will be spreading the word on social media, online. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you once again. Have a great World Food Day.